All right, so moving on to work and energy. Now, um, this is one of those where, where I wanna focus on the definitions, not on the math. I will write the math here, but make sure you understand conceptually what that means. So work, we define to be the result of applying a force over a distance. Now think about how, how you remember that like in, in terms of like maybe an integral or, or, or a derivative or something in terms of the formal definition, does that mesh with it? Work being the force applied over a distance. Yes, it does. Because we define work as the integral of force dx. But think of it more generally though as applying a force at and, and the greater distance you apply that force for, the more work you have done. So the formal definition is the work is the force applied over some, actually, let me write it like this here, over some distance. I'll write as dx. I'm going to change this here in a moment. Now, what about if you're uh, pushing to the right, but the object that you're dealing with has a prescribed path that has to go on, like it's on a train, uh, train track or something. So the, if the objects, let's see, let me do it with different pencils over here, uh, pens, markers, whatever. If you're applying a force to the right, at every moment, let's say the force is pulling right. So the force in all cases going in the i-hat direction. So the F in this case here is in the i-hat. Now, I hope you're familiar with that. If not, uh, go back and relearn what it is. I don't know how you would have missed it. Um, the, let's see. If you, um, at each point, if you divide the displacement up into infinitesimally small points, our displacement, which I'll write here as delta x with a vector sign, may very well be at any given moment at an angle to the direction the force is being applied. And specifically with a curving path, the angle might change as a continuous function. So it turns out the way to deal with this, if you have a force that varies, or if you have a path that varies or both, at each instance, you divide that path into small segments and take the dot product of those two things. And this is assumed to be over some finite period of time, of course. So it's more formally a dot product or a path integral, a line integral specifically. Um, the, and notice here again, the definition, the equation-wise definition is very consistent with how I described it in words. It's a force given over a distance. Um, then the next thing we recognize is that let's say we are applying a force onto an object and we're pushing it forwards. In other words, if the dot product at all times is positive, so that, that's what I'm getting at here. So the force and the, the, the um, displacement are not necessarily parallel, but at least they're in general the same direction, so that the cosine of the angle is going to be greater than zero. That, that's my uh, angle cosine, that's not my alligator thing. So um, as long as these things are at an angle of less than 90 degrees relative to one another, you are generally pushing in the same direction as the object is moving. Why is that important? If you are generally pushing in the same direction of motion, what's going to happen to that motion? It's going to speed up. And specifically, the reason why it speeds up is that if you're doing positive work, which this evaluates to a positive value, if you are doing positive work, that means you are transferring energy to that object. Now, if the dot product is negative, in other words, if the object is moving to the, was it, the, moving to the right, but you're pushing backwards on it, you're trying to stop a slowly rolling semi, something like that, you're pushing that way with the displacement that way. In that case, the dot product will be negative, meaning that as you apply a force in the opposite direction of, of, of that force, um, as, as you apply a force, if you're doing negative work, you are sucking energy from that system. Now, a, a kind of a um, morbid example of that is if you're just standing there and a, and a semi comes full speed and hits you. <laughs> you know, in that case, it's a relatively short amount of distance they're applying that force because you go bouncing off. But in that case, there's negative work done. By resisting the motion of that semi, which again, you have no choice, you're, you're, you're basically interacting with it when it hits you, you push back there, it's gonna push you backwards. So you're applying a force that way, but you get pushed that way. So the dot product here is negative. In other words, if you're doing negative work on the object, you're sucking energy from that object. So the effect of that is that the semi slows down just a little, 
but you gain a whole lot of speed because you don't need nearly as much speed to translate to a greater amount of energy. Um, I think I said that right. So anyway, the point is that you, you take energy from the system it's, if it's a negative dot product. You pass energy to the system if it's a positive. And all of that translates to the work energy theorem. And this is a fundamental principle of physics. The work that you do on an object tells you exactly how much that object's total energy changes. I, I can't underscore that enough. This is the fundamental, it, it's almost the def definition of energy. Now energy is, um, I don't know how long I've been doing physics. Um, I don't know how long the universe has been doing physics. No definition of energy has ever made like perfect sense. I don't think there is a actual way to define energy. This is the closest to it. The way we define energy is by, by applying a force over, over a given distance and then saying that must equal the change in energy. So this is essentially, it's an operational definition. When we do work on an object, we transfer energy to that object, if positive, or we take energy away from it, if negative. Or now we go around and we define energy, and this is why I think it's hilarious. Um, so, so we've defined work as this. Now we go and define energy as the ability to do work on an object. <laughs> How bizarre is that? that? But that's literally what we do in physics. So we define work as the ability to, do it, uh, to, to change energy, and we define energy as the ability to do work on an object. Go figure. So anyway, um, that is what the work energy principle says. Now, um, as you know, the units that we use for work, if you do that, newtons times meters. The units we use for energy, if you, yeah, let's just throw out here. Um, if you, for example, calculate kinetic energy, now as you should all know, the kinetic energy of an object is one half mv squared. Um, the uh, gravitational potential energy of an object is mgh. Now, the important requirement here is you need to define what your zero point is of energy. So typically, we assume that the lowest point you can go is where we have zero gravitational energy. There are many situations where it makes more sense to define your y-coordinate system starting at a given value, um, maybe not necessarily at ground level. So anyway, this is the relative gravitational potential energy. And we know the spring potential energy, which by the way, you guys probably use different letters. You'll see K and U, or U sub G, U sub S, whatever. But the spring potential energy, if you have a spring of a given spring constant K, this becomes one half K and delta X squared, where the delta X squared is the distance the spring has been stretched from equilibrium. Again, you guys all know this to be true from, from just like memorizing these equations. Um, this equation here specifically is, is it's fun to derive from Hooke's law, the, the fact that as you stretch a spring, it resists stretching proportional to the distance that it's already been stretched. So anyway, if you integrate Hooke's law, you get the spring energy. So you put Hooke's law kx dx, one half kx squared. So pretty useful. Um, the last thing related, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> probably the most important thing, and then the last thing, the most important thing, if you imagine a situation where if we have no work done on a, on a system, now specifically I'm using the word system here to be a, a collection of objects that are isolated from their surroundings. So by isolated, what I mean by definition is we do not allow for any external objects to apply a force onto the objects in the system. So very naturally, by definition, if you prevent any outside forces acting on the system, you can't put anything inside this integral. If there's no, no outside force, there is no work that the external objects can do on the members of the system. So what that means is externally, there can't be any exchange of energy from inside that system to objects outside that system. I hope that makes sense. This is definitely not how it would be explained the first day of class in Physics 1. But if you, if you break any sort of contact with the outside world, the objects inside of that you know, closed system can interact with one another. They can exchange energy, they can do work on each other, they can exchange a joule at a time, 10 joules at a time. But when you add up the total energy within that system, it will never change because there is never any work being done by outside objects. Therefore, 
There is no ability for energy to be transferred outside of the system. It's only be being between the objects. So what that means is, in the absence of outside forces, if F external, or maybe if, if the uh, external forces are zero, what that means is the work on the system must also be zero. And by the work energy theorem, that means that the total energy is conserved. I'm writing it slightly different. The, uh, the total energy never changes. Or that's synonymous with is conserved. I, that's what I said. I don't know if you can read that. But the total energy will never change. It is conserved. So whatever energy the system starts with, the system ends with. This is one of the four essential things that the universe knows how to do. The universe knows how to conserve energy. If you view this, the universe as a whole, there's nothing outside the universe. There's no way for the universe ever to leach out energy or to gain energy from outside of it. So the universe knows how to conserve energy really, really well. And that's what it does. Somehow or another, no matter how things move in the universe, the energy is always conserved in the universe. So, you know, one of the questions that, you know, I would eventually like to ask um, whatever, insert name of being that created the universe is how, how did he or she choose those fundamental laws of the, of the universe to govern themselves? Or maybe did they have no choice? Maybe universes just simply don't work if energy is not conserved. And I think most physicists will probably say that's actually very true. So think about that. All right, let's move on to the next thing here.